welcome all of you. I hope you can hear and, and see us. Uh, and this is uh, the third and final webinar uh, of the RIPAD project that concludes our project uh, today. Uh, we have about 46, as I can see, uh, attendees. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. And uh, I will start shortly with the presentation of the project. You are also able to see a part of our uh, speakers today. Uh, one more will, will be joining later on. So, all the participants uh, are normally muted, but you will get the chance to pose questions uh, after the presentations and I will explain you how, how to do that. This is for the audience. So, after this, this uh, short introduction, I will, um, okay, I think, okay, yeah, I hope you can see me now as well, so it's, it's Anna. I will uh, start by uh, introducing the, some of the project results and then give the floor to our uh, representatives from the research infrastructures who are uh, participating in the, in the pilots. So let me share my screen. Okay, sorry. I hope you can all see my screen now. If any, anyone from the panel could maybe just confirm that so that I know that. Yes, 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 can, yeah, we, can, we can see it. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me start uh, by uh, sharing some, some slides from, uh, from our project. And the title of this third, third webinar uh, that is uh, meant to really illustrate the, the results and the, the, the achievement of the pilots uh, 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 that were uh, carried out by the different research infrastructures participating in the, this exercise is a spotlight on impact pathway insights, what our eyes have learned about their impact and impact study requirements. So as mentioned, this is the third of the series. The, the, uh, the previous two webinars uh, involved uh, research infrastructure managers who also share their experiences with uh, impact assessment uh, at, in, in their own uh, areas. And uh, the second webinar, which was um, focused on policy making needs, requirements, as well as, as feedback to, to what, on what we have developed. So, uh, the, the, the meeting, uh, the webinar today will uh, unfold as follows. So, with, after the, this first introductions, there will be a short presentation, uh, as mentioned, and then we will give the floor to the pilot projects, and there will be uh, six presentations from uh, Alba, Daisy, CERN, Elixir, Eatris, and, and CESDA. Uh, and after each of these presentations, you, you will have a chance, the audience, to uh, make one or two questions, short questions, just after the presentations. And then at the end, we hope to have some time uh, for, uh, for a short uh, wrap up. Okay. So uh, this will be our speakers today. Uh, from Alba, we have Gaston Garcia, uh, Daisy uh, Hans-Jürgen Donat, uh, from CERN Irene Crespo-Garrido, 
Elixir, it will be Corinne Marta speaking, and from Eatris, uh, Anne Charlotte Fovel, and Sesda Il Ivana Ilyashish Versic. Concerning the participant uh, information, so you will see in the control window of the uh, this uh, webinar uh, software um, a place where you can enter your questions. It is marked here, and you you just type in a question, and our uh, colleague uh, Henning will uh, take this into account and and moderate the question part. So it should be rather straightforward and you will be unmuted at that time. So uh, for those of you who have not maybe heard yet uh, the previous seminars or have not uh, uh, followed the project uh, during its lifetime, uh, we are coordinated Coordination and Support Action funded, funded by Horizon 2020. We have started on the eight, uh, in January 2018 for a duration of 30 months. So we are really at the end now. Our project uh, consortium consists of eight partners, uh, four of which are organizations that deal with various aspects of uh, research infrastructure, impact assessment, uh, uh, elements. Uh, we have EFIS as the coordinator, the CECIL Center for Industrial Studies in Milano, uh, specifically uh, with specific expertise in uh, methodologies for impact assessment. I come from the European Science Foundation and uh, my colleague uh, Henning is from Fraunhofer. On top of that, we have four uh, research infrastructures that have joined the project, Elixir, CERN, ALBA and DAISY, they will be presenting today. And we will, we also have, and we are happy, very happy to have two additional infrastructures who are not formally a part of the consortium, EATRIS and SESDA, but have been uh, collaborating with us on the pilots. Now, in terms of mission, um, the project was set to provide the tool that will support the impact assessment of research infrastructures and specifically look into uh, the contributions to economy and society. The goal was to uh, let's say improve the understanding of long-term impacts on various types of research infrastructures. In terms of approaches that we have taken, uh, from the beginning, we really wanted to take into account the diversity and the specificity of research infrastructures. Of course, they have different missions, they're of different type and, and, and also in different stages of development. Now, uh, the, from the point of view of, of methodology and the approach we, we have taken, from the beginning, again, it was a participatory uh, approach uh, that was uh, set to uh, involve as many as possible research infrastructures to cover as much as possible the diversity and involve them in the co-design process. So this was done uh, by organizing a series of workshops that uh, through which we, we have gathered input uh, on, on the different aspects of, of our work. Uh, the, the goal and the, and the aim is to uh, provide uh, as much as possible a, a tool that would be practical and that can serve the needs of different stakeholders, policymakers, funders and RI managers. So I will very briefly mention this at the, at the very end. And of course, what with our work, we, we hope to contribute to, to more common approaches for impact assessment uh, of research infrastructures in Europe uh, in the first place, but also internationally. Now, in terms of contributions uh, to, to our, uh, of our project, what we would like to highlight today is that what we see as the main uh, outcomes are the, the identification of three, 13 uh, generic impact pathways that can be applied to all research infrastructures and that start from, uh, say, a direct sphere of control of research infrastructures, their activities, and lead to impacts in society and economy. Uh, we have grouped these under three, uh, say, high-level high missions or headings. Uh, these are enabling science, problem solutions, and science and society. 
Now, uh, in terms of concrete pathways, I will not take the time to go through through all of them, but you will see here their titles, and uh, they are grouped under these uh, high-level uh, missions. And you will recognize, I think, already from the fir this first group, some some activities that are relevant to you. Uh, we have uh, pathways that focus on the scientific recognition, on employment, technology transfer, and different aspects of learning and training involving the development of new instruments, training of users, and training of young researchers. Uh, problem solving, it's a heading that uh, is more targeted towards I would say applied uh, approaches and, and solution of either uh, problems for the private sector or addressing more generally societal and public sector challenges. Of course, there is a, also a specific uh, heading for uh, data related infrastructures that have more and more importance. Uh, pathways that relate to science and society uh, are also there, covering aspects related to changing the way science is being done, creating networks, promoting engagement between science, society and policy and communication. Now, uh, in terms of concrete uh, um, outputs, again, there we have worked to develop a long list of indicators and we have grouped them uh, according to uh, three labels. So these are activity, outcome and impact. And they have been assigned to different pathways. This work follows closely and builds on previous work done by the OECD, S3 and other initiatives that have also uh, devised uh, uh, lists of indicators. Again, what we have focused on was to really detail and describe uh, impacts on society and economy, and more specifically in terms of human resources, economy and innovation, society and policy. So there are some descriptions of these uh, different types of impacts. And uh, again, uh, the, the whole work was concluded by the pilot exercises. Um, now, what we hope again to have contributed to is also to introduce a more share, a shared uh, impact assessment language across diverse stakeholders groups, and this is seen as something that was, was needed. And also uh, what we were very pleased to discover is that we, we have managed somehow to, to, to gather around this project a quite a significant community of practice of, of people uh, responsible for impact assessment at their own uh, research infrastructures. And this has given many uh, good opportunities for exchange and, and uh, promoting common understanding and cross-fertilization. So I will end my presentation here. And uh, of course, if there are any questions, uh, we can take them maybe at the end, uh, once when you ha have heard all of the uh, input uh, from the pilots as well. Just to give you the final um, uh, the final view, uh, I will show you here uh, the online tool that is still uh, being developed. It will be available online uh, shortly and you will be able to browse and see uh, how this uh, framework has been implemented and and designed to be accessible hopefully to broad uh, broad uh, community of users okay so i'm not sure that i hope you can still see me browsing quickly through through this online tool but uh, as the time is limited i will stop here you will of course receive the notification when this becomes available if you subscribe to our social uh, media okay so uh i would like uh, with this to uh, conclude and give the floor to our first um speaker this is gaston uh, garcia from um alba let me just uh, switch to you as presenter gaston you should be able to share your screen very shortly. Please. 
Gaston, I think we are ready for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now. I think I should be showing my screen. Yeah, we see you. Yeah. Is that working right? Okay. It is working fine. So thanks, very, thanks very much. It is my pleasure to present this uh, pilot project, which is called From Experiments to Innovation, on behalf of my colleagues from ALBA and XIL. So uh, you see that the project uh, out. The results of this pilot are available in this uh, report, which uh, is reachable. I will show you on the web page of RIPath project. And the contents of the talk will be first showing you briefly the context of ALBA and uh, other similar facilities, which uh, are together in this League of European Accelerator-based Photon Sources LIPS how the pathway approach is important to understand uh, the impacts of ALBA, what is the scheme of the pilot we did together with XIL, and then some selected results, and there I will be very brief, and I will invite you to go to the, to the report itself, and I will devote some minutes at the end to uh, tell you what we learned out of this pilot at ALBA. So ALBA is a photon source, where we have, uh, you have down here some global numbers. Uh, we have eight beam lines providing each of them uh, about 5,000 hours of uh, experiments per year. We are receiving more than 2,000 researchers per year. And you see that the size of a facility can be seen by the number of staff, which is somewhat above 200, and the total uh, number for initial investment, which is slightly above 200 million as well. So it's one of the many facilities collaborating together in this league, in the SLIPS. You see all of them here all across Europe. And you see that it comprises 16 institutions in 10 different countries, some of them international. And uh, they are serving more than 30,000 users with advanced multidisciplinary techniques being a major driver for science and technologies and undergoing a very interesting change in uh, technologies at the moment collaborating together for the development of strategies during the next 10 years and beyond so uh, when we uh, joined this effort this RI paths effort uh, by alba uh, we started to learn about this pathway approach so we look at impacts with a dynamical point of view. We look at the activities done by RIs, not as a fixed picture, but as a process that uh, where there is a flow of activities from the activities by the RI to outcomes and impacts. And uh, we uh, have learned to see the traditional key performance indicators, not at fixed pictures of what is, uh, has happened, as a, but as proxies to measure this flow. So depending where these proxies are, whether they are closer to the activity upstream or to the impact downstream, you, uh, you can use them differently. It's a very complex landscape where uh, even if we have done an effort to simplify and, uh, and offer you a number of pathways, there are many branchings of the pathways and uh, interconnections. This is a very fertile framework to understand better the complexity of how impacts are produced in our eyes. Also, for, for our eyes themselves, it's a very good tool to rethink the, the effort done and the weight given to some activities which are, which are sometimes non-core activities. And you understand better how useful it is to, uh, to uh, put some weight on them. And of course, to raise always many more questions than answers. You, have a lot of questions when you start to dig deep into this. So this is a very simplified picture where I have on purpose made it uh, a bit um, um, naive, so to say, to show you how complex it is for us. And uh, I don't want to go through all the details in this graph, but I want to tell you that in this upper uh, upper corner here on the upper left, 
you see the traditional programs, which are the core activity of photon sources and other RIs, which is opening publicly the possibility to do experiments. And this generates users coming to do experiments and publications, then citations in the end, and you generate knowledge via this route. This is the core business. Then, in addition, we always have the possibility of proprietary access, by mainly by industries. And uh, these two are always seen as, as traditional uh, routes to, to use an RI. Now, what we have started to see already a few years ago uh, at ALBA and other RIs is that the impact of industry as a user is not exhausted by this proprietary uh, channel. In many cases, we know that industry is involved uh, in some ways with uh, public users. And we have started to include in our user application questionnaires a couple of questions about uh, the possibility that public users, academic users, have some degree of collaboration with industry. And this is as far as we went until a few months ago, just having a few questions in the application questionnaires for public users. But now we have studied together with XIL uh, with a lot more depth how this channel develops in relation to innovation and how it in the end has some uh, branching to this innovation part. So what we have done is to look a little bit further into these proprietary experiments and to understand, try to understand how academic ones also generate innovation impacts. This is the natural choice, but this is much less explored. It's less well known, so I will mainly focus on this one during the next slides. What we did was to prepare a useful survey. Indeed, there were uh, different types of surveys. And uh, we went to our users and uh, asked them to fill in these surveys. And we got a very useful uh, number of answers. And then we adopted a different uh, route of exploration. Uh, and we went to data mining in patent databases. So all the details you have available at this website that you see here. In red, I really invite you to go to the report. You can concentrate on some sections of the report or read the whole of it, and you will see many interesting details. So uh, first, uh, one thing we saw is that, as we already guessed or knew, our academic users very rarely collaborate strongly with industry already at the application stage. So only in, in less than 5% five, five of the cases, they already say that when proposing an experiment, they're already in contact with industry. Now, if you look by beamline, and this means by area, you see that the ratio of uh, public, uh, sorry, pure basic research or uh, research with application orientation or even industrial relevant research is very different in the different cases, but industrially relevant research is declared a priori only at the maximum of 10% level in some areas and uh, much smaller for other areas, whereas application orientation research can be as much as two-thirds in some areas. Now, uh, we wondered also how long it would take to produce some innovation impacts for our uh, academic users, and you see that this changes a lot in pure basic research. In most of the cases, uh, our users are not able to answer these questions, more than half than half of the cases. Now, if you move to application orientation research or industrially relevant research, you see that uh, the situation is much uh, more favorable. And you see that in most cases, they say that it takes three to five years, but in a relevant number of cases, it goes as long as eight to 10 years. This is very interesting for us because this is comparable to the, to the age of ALBA as a facility. So this tells you that any quantification you attempt to do with a young facility may be biased uh, downwards by this. Now uh, you see, and I will not go for the details in this slide, but this varies, this duration to a time lapse for impact varies a lot depending on which area you, uh, you uh, talk about. So it's... Uh, a little bit shorter in uh, chemistry, surface science, or protein crystallography, longer in other cases. So I will not go through the details, just to tell you that depending on the area, it varies a lot. Now, our academic users mainly 
overwhelmingly they produce publications, peer-reviewed journal publications. They do not produce patents on a regular basis. Only 4% of the cases declare that they uh, sometimes produce patents, and one-third of the cases said, tell us that uh, rarely, but at least they don't discard the option, they would produce patents. So it's not directly with our academic users that we have to search for innovation impacts. We have to go one step forward. What type of impact impacts are we talking about? We're talking about development of new technologies, new products, improving technical know-how, improving R&D capabilities, improving the quality of existing products, developing new patents, copyrights, or other. These are the impacts that they tell us would eventually be relevant. Now, in these questionnaires, uh, we learned uh, some interesting things, but it was much more new for us and much more surprising, if you want to explain it that way, what we learned by doing data mining. So we were, we started with this almost 2,000 publications, which are based on the work done at ALBA, by Beam Time at ALBA or developments at ALBA. Uh, and we did a search in uh, patent databases, and we found uh, more than 30 patents, 35 patents, citing directly these papers. So some of these were uh, cases that we knew about already, but most of the cases we didn't know. We didn't have any information about this before. So this was very interesting and important. And uh, even more surprising to us, because here the connection is quite direct, is that if you look at papers not based on beam time at Palba, but citing our original papers, uh, these original papers based on uh, work done at Alba are called P0, whereas this P1 is papers citing P0 papers. Now we did the same exercise of patent citation, but looking at these P1 papers, so at papers which are indirectly based on work done at Alba. And there we found three times, uh, sorry, 10 times more patents than down here, so more than 300 patents. And these are completely out of scope of what we had uh, thought of studying before. Now, uh, this is a somewhat complex slide, but I will just tell you briefly, this is about these patents in red, citing these P1 publications in blue. In most cases, it's one patent citing one publication. It's this type of topology, one uh, red dot uh, connected to one blue dot. But in some cases, you see that some P1 publications are really fertile. They have produced citations in different patents. And in some cases, there are patents which look at many different P1 publications. So they're topologically very different cases. And some chains of uh, some patents, several patents connected to several publications and uh, in, a, in a funny way. And you see here on the right, the time lapse from the moment that some publications uh, are happening, are published in the moment that they are cited by patents. And you see that the time it takes, it may be a couple of years, it may be three or four years. And this is compared to the scale uh, that you see of the ALBA history itself, as I said before. So some key findings that I want to summarize here for you. Experiment applications at ALBA rarely involve direct academy industry connections. This happens later. And uh, we have the impression by looking at the questionnaire that the technology transfer units at university and at user institutions uh, tend to have uh, a relevant contribution to this happening a posteriori. Now, the experiment results produced at facilities such as ALBA are generally, even in the case of proprietary users, only indirectly applicable to innovation. It's rare that they report a direct application. It's always more complex than that. Now, the pathway to innovation via experiments is much faster in some areas than in others. So depending on the weight, on the weight that the facility has in a given area or another, uh, the time needed to, to look for these impacts is much uh, different. I wanted to put here the numbers of these patent citations explicitly. So we have found 
several patent citations directly citing ALBA publications, and many more citing indirectly ALBA, so citing papers which in turn cite ALBA. This has been completely new for us. It's a completely new route, both for the type of chain of connections and for the way that this information has been gathered by data mining. The time scale for innovation is very different depending on the areas. And these time scales are really comparable to the lifetime of some young facilities such as ALBA. So one has to take a lot of care when doing quantitative conclusions. Now, for the first time, we have systematically studied innovation impacts. Until now, we had gathered some uh, KPI uh, numbers and, and uh, done some statistics, but we had never really pursued in detail this. Now, we have learned that these user surveys are really useful, but of course, they require uh, a lot of effort to contact your users, and they require some patience for your users, by your users, which was very positive in our case, but this is something you cannot do every six months. But on the other hand, this data mining approach was completely new to us. It opens up wide, uh, very new ways of looking and quantifying impact. We will do things of this type uh, in the future, I think, for sure. Yeah. Now, of course, you need some follow-up, particularly, as I mentioned before, time scales are tricky, are very tricky in the case of young facilities, so you need to look at the same type of questions or maybe some other things uh, in some time from now. And of course, ALBA is but one of this wide class of uh, RIs, so I'm absolutely sure that the exercise will be found as very interesting by other LEAPS colleagues, and this is, uh, we have some indications that this is already the case. Now, some questions. We have done many interesting things in this pilot, but we are already thinking how could we more systematically uh, learn about this innovation impacts. We have a hint uh, in the answer that data mining techniques will be essential for this. We have a strong impression that we are looking at something like an iceberg peak, yeah? and we wonder how large is the mass of ice beneath the water. We have to be extremely careful when we attribute these impacts to a, a facility because of this uh, long citation chains. And uh, to conclude, this whole exercise has been really enlightening for ALBA. It will be very interesting for LEAPS. And I come to my final conclusion. This involves always many people collaborating. And uh, in this case, the collaboration with, with XIL and the RIPATH colleagues has been essential to learn all this. Thanks a lot. Thank you uh, very much, Gaston. Um, just for the sake of time, I would suggest to move on with the next presenter. And then if there are questions, please note them uh, and we may take them then. Uh, questions for Alba, I mean, we may take them at the end. So I will switch to Hans uh, Jürgen for your presentation, please. So thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I'll try to start my presentation. Okay. So, um, so I would like to introduce uh, our experience at, at Daisy with uh, the RIPAS uh, pilot project, and uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will start by uh, giving you an overview about Daisy itself, uh, what we do and what we are. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about implementing our RIPAS pilot study, and finally I will concentrate on the lessons learned. Um, so DAISY is one of the world's leading accelerator centers, and we are developing, building, and operating unique research tools. Uh, our facilities are used to explore the microcosm. That means that we look at uh, tiny elementary particles. Uh, we look at, uh, for example, new types of nanomaterial to biomolecular processes uh, that are essential to life. Uh, per year, we uh, receive about 3,000 guest researchers from more than 40 countries. And uh, as you might expect, DAISY is dedicated uh, to basic research on structure and functioning of matter. And uh, we are preparing the knowledge base for the world of tomorrow. 
but DAISY also works with uh, industry and business uh, to develop new technologies that benefit society and promote innovation. Um, DAISY is running uh, quite a few of uh, different facilities and uh, for the uh, pilot uh, uh, project we uh, just wanted to concentrate on two of them, on uh, photon science facilities Petra3 and FLASH. Uh, Petra3 is a synchrotron radiation source and uh, FLASH is a free electron laser and they offer um, high precision analytical techniques uh, which are used to understand fundamental processes. Um, all of these processes uh, encompass an enormous range of temporal and length scales um, that reaches from atomic distances to macroscopic dimensions. Um, we want to get a deeper insight into matter and why are we doing this? Well, that's because it is key for future developments in both in uh, basic research and in applied research. And uh, this is important, uh, especially for the solving of global challenges, uh, which are typically closely linked to understanding the processes in nature and the underlying interactions. Um, at DAISY, uh, we naturally also collect a lot of data to, uh, due to our uh, duties uh, for uh, our funders uh, to, to uh, produce them reports every year. And some of uh, the KPIs we are using and other relevant information of both, for both facilities are collected at least once a year, but most of the data is available in daily resolution. So that is, for example, technical parameters and performance indicators, uh, which are of great relevance for our users by, by which they choose um, which, which um, streamline they, they are going to use or um, what kind of equipment they will have available. Um, I don't want to go too much into details of, of that, but um, uh, some examples are uh, well data on, on the beam time for users, uh, data on the technical operation of daisy light sources, the total plant beam time of all users. Um, so uh, similar as, as Alba, uh, each of our light sources uh, delivers typically about four to 5,000 hours of beam time per year for users. Uh, we are running all of our facilities typically in a 24-hour operation, uh, organized in uh, three or two shifts, uh, respectively eight-hour shifts uh, or 12-hour shifts. Um, the access to our facilities uh, is managed in a database named DOOR. Um, where we collect the user data um, from which research fields they come, uh, how much uh, beam time they request, um, the peer review process of a propo proposals and so on. Um, for users from industry, we have special conditions and uh, apply application procedures, um, but basic data of the um, industrial users are also available. Um, information on patents, number of startups, industrial case studies, and so on, um, are collected at another department at DAISY, the Innovation and Technology Department. Um, well, uh, another important thing is uh, that um, the use of DAISY's facilities typically is free of charge for all research that is published according to established standards. And that means that uh, publications resulting for, uh, from experimental or uh, related theoretical activities at Petra 3 or FLASH are essentially a measure uh, of scientific productivity. And therefore, they should be registered in our online DAISY publication database. All the bibliometric data uh, is stored, including other related information. That means uh, which facility is used or which beamline is used. Uh, uh, details about the institution and their home countries uh, which, which are involved in this research, uh, selected journal impact factors and, and more and more. Um, collecting all this, this information is one thing but uh, to do an impact study means a little bit more. That's what we learned from, from our involvement in RFPAFs and we were happy to have the opportunity to do this um, our pilot study and uh, we 
were looking at two special aspects. Uh, we wanted to learn more about the composition and the motivation of users of our light sources, and we uh, expected to obtain possible indications for further impact pathways that should be examined in more detail in the future. Um, our central instrument for the pilot, uh, pilot study was an online survey addressing uh, users of Petra Free and Flash. The survey was sent to uh, roughly uh, 1,700 users, uh, which were identified via our DOOR user database. And the response rate was uh, better than 15% than for completed questionnaires. Um, I would like to mention some general limitations which became apparent for us only when we were um, preparing the survey. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in the end, they are negligible for the purpose of a pilot study. In the uh, DOOR database, we actually have more than 14,000 active users. But um, as um, most of you will know, the European General Data Protection Regulation requires that uh, we would have the express consent uh, of the persons entered in the database in order to be able to contact them. And that was only the case for the number mentioned before. Um, another problem uh, seems to be that commercial users uh, mostly want their activities to be kept confidential. That means also that their readiness to be involved in this kind of uh, surveys is not as big as um, with other uh, people. Um, and the other thing which were also uh, mentioned by uh, our colleague from, from Alba is that companies are often only indirectly involved in the measurements because they are partners in academic consortia. Um, I don't want to go too much into the details of, uh, of, of the survey, uh, but instead I, I would like to present you the lessons we have learned uh, uh, and uh, some, some, um, uh, some uh, points which are derived from results of the survey. Um, so um, not unexpectedly uh, for, for most of you, basic research infrastructures have uh, social and economic impacts in more ways than is normally recognized in traditional procurement studies. Um, basic research is typically perceived by uh, the people we asked as uh, contributing to applied questions by those conducting it. But uh, benefits and spillover effects for non-academic users uh, seem to be higher than initially expected by us. Um, well, it seems that the collaboration between the different actors, uh, be it uh, BRI, the industry, public institution, with different missions, um, BRI is typically science, uh, the industry typically business, and the public institution securing the well-being of society, is a key success factor for uh, each of the uh, projects. Uh, DAISY offers uh, unique equipment and excellent service for both scientific and industrial users uh, in an outstanding scientific environment. Uh, and we learned that there are many collaborations with long-term users that have built trust with and a good understanding of the research facilities and the personnel operating them. Um, we also noticed that it is less the infrequent direct use of facilities by external industrial partner uh, that triggers short-term impact, but more these organizations' participation in broader consortia, in uh, which new insights are conveyed in a collaboration between scientific, societal, and industrial partners. That's something which was also uh, mentioned by uh, Gaston, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's really an uh, interesting fact. Um, well, the socioeconomic impact studies are a valuable tool of uh, demonstrating the broader benefit of research infrastructure activities, and they are a useful complement to demonstrate the societal benefit of investment in science. However, um, the realization of short to midterm socioeconomic benefits is not the primary mission of most RIs and uh, naturally not of DAISY. And the way in which they occur differs substantially between the different facilities. Uh, nevertheless, DAISY is aware of uh, the importance of uh, socioeconomic benefits and uh, uh, strengthens applied research and industrial use. 
the individual characteristics and mission of a specific RI make even comparisons between technically similar facilities unreliable. Just keep that in mind when, when you set up your own uh, impact study. Uh, accordingly, impact studies cannot be conducted in a manner standardized enough to create ranking lists, meaningful enough to support investment decisions as such. That's some point we have heard in, in the earlier uh, webinars as well. So um, I think this is a very important point. Um, causal change are not easy to show and financial input cannot always be linked linearly to assumed or real effects, uh, great care should be taken in limiting the consideration of socioeconomic impacts of science to a simple return of investment perspective. Due to the substantial differences in technical setup and mission of different RIs, narrative elements and case studies should be a significant uh, addition to impact assessment in order to explain and contextualize the hard facts presented. The uh, impact pathways concept demonstrates the diversity of interactions and relationships based on which impacts materialize as a result of specific research activities. Moreover, it uh, underlines that uh, uh, the uh, impact can often be uh, reliable assessed after long periods of time. Um, for an RI, the main benefit uh, uh, is to get an assessment of its impact performance and uh, by this it can discover potential for fut uh, future involvement in the area, uh, increasingly relevant to its funders. Uh, from the DAISY's perspective, um, while the long-term benefits should remain the main rationale for investments in fundamental science infrastructures, uh, their direct impus, uh, impacts are substantial and could be more prevalently uh, put forward as valid source for justification for investments. And it might be worthwhile to future analyze the reasons for a long-term relationship of many users with DAISY, and this could serve as an argument for investing in major uh, facility modernizations. Um, one thing we learned from, from uh, looking at the data was uh, that it might be interesting to uh, investigate the behavior and composition of users of a specific group, in our case, the life science community, which could bring more insight into the practical routines at DAISY and other entities, which are located at the DAISY campus, uh, like uh, our, uh, the institutions EMBL, CSSB, or CFL. So um, I think the final remarks um, can be very short. Um, when, when we are required to, to do impact um, assessments, it's not because uh, only because we have to, to document our quality, but also our relevance for, um, uh, for other areas with metrics. And um, that means we have to be very careful uh, about this. There is no simple answer to uh, uh, everything and metrics and key figures are of great importance but be careful, they must always be placed in a suitable context and uh, as a systematic collection uh, of key figures and performance indi indicators, uh, DAISY has done a lot of this kind of work. Um, I think I would like to, final, uh, to, to finish here and uh, to, thank you everybody, uh, to thank everybody for uh, your attention. Okay, thanks, bye. Uh, Thank you, uh, Hans Jürgen, and uh, thank you also for for keeping the time. Uh, again, uh, I would uh, move on uh, and just to keep the, the schedule uh, roughly, and then we will hopefully have some time at the end for questions from the audience. So, Irene, you may um, uh, take the floor. Mm, okay. You can see the presentation. Um, yes, now it yeah now it's in the presenters mode. If you can switch to the uh, okay. the other mode. Still the same. We yes, but I what. Mm. Maybe you have two screens. Yes, but uh, on Friday, what? 
we still we see your notes yes but Uh, this is Corinne. I had the same problem. Perhaps you need to select a different screen in the go to panel. That solved it for me last week. But Thank you. On Friday, we did. <laughs> I now try display settings, Iran. Now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, I am Irene Crespo, and I have developed with my supervisor, Johannes Goodlever, a study about the cultural value of tourists at CERN. In addition, uh, we work in other studies, but I will focus on explaining the methodology and the real data obtaining on tourist at CER, okay? Uh, this is the, the model we, we based uh, our studies since 2016. We use six pillars to analyze the, the socioeconomic impact of the organization. It is very similar to the Every Path, Pathways project. And the pillars are a science product, education and training, industrial spillovers, ICT, and data spillovers, cultural effects, and public good value. Well, uh, first to explain the cultural value of tourists at CERN, I want to show the variables used to estimate the cultural value at CERN. The variables are consume time value of presence in traditional media, uh, includes non specialist press articles, books, TV, movies, and radio. Also, consume time value in social media. We take into account the real time value of post, the right time value of referring post, and also the read time value of referring post and reactions. We use the variables, uh, also the consume time value of web pages and YouTube. And finally, the study I'm going to show, the spending and time value of on-site visitors. The motivation we got to revise the, the value of on-site visitors was the study carried out on between 2012 and 2016 that estimates the value based on travel cost method. Uh, the problem was that this method is not exact since the origin of the visitors is not known. The method underestimates the actual economic value since it focused on the distant basis travel cost method and travel time value. This survey was carried out anonymously to the visitors of the CERN during a year between June 2018 and May 2018. With it, we obtain in the real expenses of the visitors and identify the, the causal relationship with visit. In this slide, you can see the questionnaire you see to, to carry out the study and the different questions asked to the visitors. And the variables you see in this study were the following the duration of the travel as a time value, and as a direct cost were cost of travel, accommodation, transport in the region, food, and regional purchase. At the end, we consider the variable the further visits, of which we consider the entrance fee. There are, we discovered that the, there are two types of visitors. The visit motivated by search research, the original motivation is the fundamental science research carried out at CERN, 
of the indicated spending side considered for the economic value generation. And the people of this visit category often travel as a part of a group. This is the, the thing we discover. Also, the second type of, of visit uh, to serve was the, the, the people travel to the region. 100% of the people traveling to the region know that SER exists and plan also a visit to SER. In this case, only 50% uh, of the individual spendings are considered to be in causal relation with SER. The time value of regional travel and the visit to SER is considered for all individual visits, visitors. In this slide, the, I'm going, I show the, the formulas for calculating the value generated by each type of visit are shown. It should be taken into account that both the value of travel time and the value of visit time have not been considered in this study, uh, but uh, will be included in future estimates. In this slide, the results of the uh, I, I show the, the results of the questionnaire revelate that the majority of visitors of visitors come from Italy, Switzerland, United Kingdom, and France. On the contrary, the countries that visit as the least are China, Japan, Australia, or Canada. It can be deduced that there is a great influx of visitors from those countries closest to the organization. The results of training from this study after completing 900 questions were 83,000 visitors are part of a group and therefore visits there because it's the purpose of the trip. Of the 120,000 annual visitors, 37,000 visits serve as a consequence of traveling to the area. And the total expenses generated by these visitors is 84 million Swiss francs, of which 53.2 million Swiss francs come from group of visitors and 17.6 million Swiss francs from individual visits. Uh, these results were analyzed by creating the spending distribution showing showed in this slide. This graph will be used in the in future Monte Carlo simulations to assess the, the socioeconomic impact of the future circular collider project. <laughs> the conclusions obtained in this study are survey, survey confirms that curiosity about the fundamental science research performed at CERN motivates people to make a trip. Even if the distance is long and the stay needs to be extended, people voluntarily invest time and money for being close to the science exploring the origins of the universe. The main visit period is from autumn to spring because SER offers an activity that is highly completely to traditional leisure activities in spring and summer. The one-year survey basic analysis create a reliable spending distribution. Will be used for analyzing the expected economic benefits for a future circular collider at CER. The work revealed that long-term systematic sampling of visitors at CERN will be required to confirm the results and to ensure that the content created creation makes well the visitor expectation and to ensure a continued attractivity of the research infrastructure. I appreciate your question concerning that uh, I have presented to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Irene. Uh, so we are again on time. I would say thank you for, for keeping really the time strict. I think we will take uh, this uh, opportunity to, to move on. And please, for the audience, uh, note you can already put your questions in the, in the um, 
uh, in the tool and we will take them at the end. So Corinne, uh, you will be given the floor in a minute. So please, yeah, you can start. Thank you. So I think we are all set, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present on piloting the repass approach at Elixir, how we did it. Elixir, is that an acronym for something? We get asked this question quite a lot. So, uh, Elixir is a pan-European virtual and distributed research infrastructure for life science data plus. And I put plus because it's not just data and databases. It's also software, tool, compute, cloud, standards, interoperability, training, etc. Elixir is also an intergovernmental organization of 21 member countries, plus the European Bioinformatics Institute. Beyond a data infrastructure, it is also a people infrastructure. We've got more than 700 people involved in running Elixir, operating it, from more than 220 research institutes across Europe. Uh, something that's important here is that we all work together to offer more than 200 bioinformatics services, which I often refer to as resources. And these are used by millions of users globally every day, every second through the internet without even needing to apply. Um, these are freely accessible. Of course, there are exceptions, but we don't have time to go into that kind of detail now. So what Elysia does is to coordinate, integrate, and sustain. And some of this coordination is taking place at the Elixir Hub in Hingston, which is its coordinating secretariat. And this is where I am based. So your biggest question in terms of impact evaluation um, in your research infrastructure that you will perhaps ask yourself, and we asked ourselves the question, is whether you're going to be subcontracting impact evaluators impact evaluation to the experts, to the economies, to the impact evaluators, or you're going to build your own internal capacity in impact evaluation. I should say there's also an, another solution in the middle, which is to have an economist on the payroll employed in your research infrastructure. But I haven't met really any research infrastructure that has done that um, in a consistent ma manner with a permanent job. Probably because we are research organizations and this would be a bit difficult to pass by the council or the board. In any case, both approaches have pluses and minuses. If you uh, use economies, you will get really, really well done report, uh, accurate, um, great, uh, great source of information to cite uh, over the years, although it will need updating um, after a while. And you know, you get, there's a few um, great uh, companies out there that can do it for you. But what we decided to do at Elixir was to build our own internal capacity in impact evaluation. And we felt this was better for us because we wanted to have a longer legacy within the organization. We wanted to be able to uh, update that as we went. And we also wanted to have a, a deep understanding of the organization, including the country specificities. So when you are dealing with 21 member countries, uh, plus another intergovernmental organization that has its own membership. There's a lot to learn and we felt that this was probably the best way to do it, to learn. And we were really lucky to be part of the Repass project and we did a lot of learning, um, not just myself when I went to Milan to the cost-benefit analysis training course, which was fantastic, but also the Elixir country nodes, so my colleagues in the countries, and you can see a few photos here of us learning with um, the Repass partners. This was really amazing. So beyond the learning, it's very important, especially if you work in a distributed organization such as Elixir, don't try to do it just alone. Uh, find your peers, find people in your organization that care about impact evaluation and you know, take them on board, find out what they need, and together you can achieve more. So this is what I did really. Um, because it's only half of me at the Elixir Hub who works on impact evaluation. So I, I really can't do it for everybody. So I really needed to work with, with my peers across the organization. So something we did as part of the piloting is just to show you an example of something that you can do to find your peers if you don't know where they are, 
or to even just generate enthusiasm about impact evaluation in your organization. We organized a mini symposium, as it was called, during our annual event, the Elixir All Hands, and I will talk about that event a bit more later on, the rest of the event. But during that specific session, we asked Elixir partners in seven countries to pitch for funding in front of an audience pretending to be research funders. So we had 150 Elixir partners joining the session. They voted for the best presentation. The best presenter got a grant to get further training in impact evaluation to help with the legacy, to help with you know, getting uh, the knowledge shared across the organization. And one presentation I would like to highlight as well is at the bottom right, uh, which was actually um, arising from an Elixir funded staff exchange project called Empowering Elixir Nodes to measure and communicate their performance and impact. And so here we, we got some, my peers basically in the country, in Norway, in Italy, in Portugal, uh, learning as we go, uh, asking other nodes what they are doing, exchanging knowledge, and this has been extremely fruitful. So you might wonder why we asked the presenters to pitch in front of a, an audience of funders. Well, because at the end of the day, we do impact evaluations to please our funders. So it's important basically to uh, identify them first. And on this slide, you have uh, all, well, all pretty much the research infrastructure stakeholders. And the ones that are colored are the ones that pay for the research infrastructure the ones that have the money. So um, civil society, of course, they pay indirectly by a, uh, taxation, but a funding agency will give a grant directly to the organization. And something I should say here is, once you've identified them, you need to really understand that they will have different expectations in terms of messaging. So you really need to tailor your evidence of impact to what they want to hear. And this is where you know building your own capacity internally gives you this flexibility because then you can really put together the, the relevant evidence whilst if you only have one report it might work with certain audiences but it might not work with other audiences once you've identified your audience uh, you really need to articulate your impact areas because at the end of the day you're going to be asked so what is it that you are doing exactly by a research funder, and you're going to have to explain that. So what we did is we uh, put together these uh, categories of direct impact for the work typically funded by Elixir. And the two important words here are direct and funded, because we wanted to be able to link back all our efforts of the work we fund using our core funding to Elixir. So saving the world, making the world a better place, that's a bit too indirect. We, we contribute to that. We, we wanted to be explaining exactly, directly, who were the beneficiaries of what we do on an everyday basis. So, you know, I, we don't have time to go through all of them today. Uh, research efficiency, bioinformatics research uptake, research infrastructure sustainability, human capital, equal opportunity, policy influence, relationship capital, scientific knowledge, there's quite a few of them. But what I thought I would do is pick a few and show you the type of evidence that we have collected so that you get an idea of what you can do yourself. <laughs> so this is where we go, collecting evidence. Something I should say here before I forget, don't be too picky. Uh, it's great if you can get quantitative indicators, but it's really okay if you only have qualitative data if you only have testimonies, if you only have lists of examples, that is all fine, really. So starting with relationship capital, and I think this is very important for distributed research infrastructure. Why do we bother really to work together? It's because you know the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This is what supposedly Aristotle say. And in French, we would say l'union fait la force. There is something there that if you work together, you achieve more. So the example I'm giving here on this slide is uh, evidence we collected as part of a perception survey uh, at the end of an event that we fund every year called the Elixir Biohackathon. It's a big investment for us, more than 100,000 euros, just expenses, uh, the room, the travel of people, etc. 
And on top of that, you have all the in-kind contribution of the participants, 150 of them working on 30 challenges called hacking projects over five days. And what are the outcomes, the personal outcomes as a result of attending these sort of events? This is important. We are a people infrastructure. We need to really show value to our members. And so we need to make sure that whatever investment we do is really value for money. So if you ask them whether it broadened their professional network or whether it increased their understanding of other technical fields and specialties, it was overwhelmingly positive responses. People got a lot out of this event, not just the hacking and the bioinformatics work. If I move on to another one, scientific knowledge, here I'm talking about the sharing of service-related research findings. We are a research organization. We're full of researchers. We like doing research. This is what we want to do. And we need to share that research. So here I'm talking about the service-related research, not the research that we enable through our 200 bioinformatics resources used globally. This is separate. Here I'm talking about us doing service-related related research and sharing that with our peers in the organization within the 700 people of Elixir. So, Again, it's very important to our members. So we organize every year the Elixir All Hands meeting, usually oversubscribed. We usually get 300 participants for the in-person version. This year it was virtual. We got 500 participants. I can hear the little music. And the annual cost, again, more than 100,000 uh, euros. And here, you know, the, the strategic aims of that meeting are to be better informed about development, are to present your work, and are you, you know, to have an effect, you know, that this new knowledge will be used. And here it's very positive as well. Um, I will go briefly here, research efficiency. Um, in the bio uh, hackathon, we were able, using a perception survey again, to estimate the acceleration effect of bringing all these people in one room for five days. And it was between three to five. So you do go faster if you work together. And I'll finish on one type of evidence that you should not underestimate. It's the power of testimonies. By the right person, at the right time, it can mean a lot. So when you get Dr. Mike Ryan, the executive director of Health Emergencies Program at the World Health Organization, talking about wonderful resources and saying that that's the wonderful things about having publicly accessible databases is that researchers and others can have access to that data, can question that data, can generate hypotheses, et cetera, et cetera. It means a lot because the Elixir resources, they are some of these wonderful resources publicly funded. And so, you know, we were really amazed when we heard that. And it's only one person saying it, but it's an important person. So I'll leave you on to that, and I'm happy to take questions after during question time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Corinne, and uh, thank you also for these concluding slides that are very relevant today. Uh, so with this, we conclude the, the four uh, partner uh, pilots presentation, and now we will move to uh, the final two ones that come from our eyes that were not formally part of our consortium but were uh, interested enough i would say to to uh, join us in this in this work and work together with us on their own resources so again i wanted to th to thank you for for that and i will give the floor to Anne charlotte will present uh, the, the, the work that has been done uh, with Eatris. And Charlotte, uh, just a second. And yes, the floor should be yours. Okay, thank you, Anna. Yeah, it's all good. Please go ahead. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for having me today. I'm really happy to share with you a few of the lessons that we learned from this exercise. Um, I just wanted to point out that I have a very hands-on uh, lessons to share today uh, with the hope that this could be useful for newly established infrastructures or infrastructures such as ours um, that have a, a small coordination team and, uh, and smaller resources to carry out this type of exercise. And we also still uh, going through um, a lot of um, exercise, so we don't have uh, findings to share yet. Um, this is why I will uh, mostly focus on, on lessons learned. 
Um, just to start, I would like to say a few words about Eatris uh, for those of you who may not know us very well. Um, so Eatris has been an ERIC uh, since the end of 2013. We've been also in the S3 roadmap and uh, an S3 landmark for a few years now. And the main reason behind creating Eatris um, was to uh, accelerate health research. Um, I think some of you may know that um, there's still a very high failure rate um, between um, the translation of research discoveries in the lab and, and patient benefits. And this is the, the gap that we're trying to bridge. So trying to address as much as possible the translational barriers that can prevent a research discovery to ever become um, a benefit for patients. And as such, our mission is very uh, transdisciplinary because for translational research to be successful, uh, one of the cornerstones is uh, multidisciplinarity. So in every step of our work, um, we do collaborate with multiple stakeholders, academia, industry, uh, patients, and also policymakers. Uh, currently, our community is composed of 13 member states um, and we're distributed infrastructures which is composed of 110 translational research institutes, out of which uh, 45 are university medical centers. And before I dive into our experience with the pilot, um, I also wanted to explain to you um, the three main pillars of our activities. One, of course, is to provide access to academic expertise and facilities. Um, a second one, which is very important to us, is training, so training the next generation of translational scientists but also a bottom-up quality program, so ensuring that the quality of research outputs uh, improves. Um, and finally, um, as I mentioned earlier, a multi-stakeholder approach is very key in our work. So one of our key activities is to facilitate public-private collaborations. Lessons learned from the pilot. Um, just to give you an introduction to um, with what we started with. So we were very new to this whole uh, impact approach and we're very grateful for um, the support from Anna and, and her colleagues. Um, what we started to do at the beginning is based on those three main pillars of activities, try to identify um, the impact pathways. So for, this was a starting point and a very interesting exercise, I must say. So for instance, for access to academic expertise, um, the most relevant pathway for us was uh, healthcare solutions and improve patients' well-being through services provided to researchers and funders, because our main objective is to accelerate the translation between the lab and the patient. The second one uh, related to training and quality programs um, was changing fundamentals of research practices through training and education. And the third one uh, related to public private collaborations was, of course, matching industrial needs by enabling collaborations with academia. So, of course, there were quite a few challenges uh, along the way, and I will uh, mention a few of those also uh, when I share lessons learned with you. Um, of course, th the first one it may have been our uh, enthusiasm with this pilot, but also uh, our ambition uh, was the diversity of stakeholders uh, targeted by the pathways. So, because we had students, so PhDs and postdocs, uh, which are our main target group for my training activities, we also had companies, um, but also research funders as users, because we do provide services to funders to improve their research portfolio and avoid um, waste of research funding. And the fourth one, uh, which I think is a very important one, is also the impact for our AHS members to be part of the infrastructure. And in our case, um, AHS members as service providers to industry, and I'll say a few more words uh, later on about that. Um, one of the other challenge was that we, because it was a start, we wanted to also experiment. Um, we decided to look at projects that were initiated since the start of Beatrice operations. So looking at projects uh, from as early on as 2014. And then of course, um, this was all relatively new to us and uh, we have a relatively small coordination team in Amsterdam, Beatrice headquarters. Um, and limited resources uh, to dedicate to this exercise. Uh, just to give you a brief uh, overview of the timelines um, of this pilot. So um, we started in August with the first uh, teleconferences to identify the pathways. Um, after that, we had a few months to really refine the scope of the assessment, look at which projects, which users we really wanted to focus on. 
and also start preparing or improving um, impact questionnaires. So this pilot for us really much focused on developing those impact surveys that could be systematically used in the future uh, for our impact assessment. And from June, we started to uh, collect data through mailings and also semi-structured for interviews. Um, and I must say this has been uh, slowed down uh, because of the COVID-19, uh, considering that this was um, a very um, yeah, relevant um, activity for us and our members got very busy with multiple research projects. Uh, so that has slowed down our activity, I must say, um, because it ex exactly matched with when we were starting to plan our data collection. And then later this year in the autumn, we plan to present our preliminary results to the Assembly of Members and also have a, a more refined uh, AHS methodology for impact assessment in the future. Um, let me then just share with you five main lessons that, that we learned. And, and they might be quite obvious, but, but actually I hope they will be, they will be useful to, to some of you um, attending the webinar today. Uh, the first one is that it's also very time and human resource intensive. It can easily deprioritize. So I think it's very important also to start to have very realistic uh, objectives and very realistic goals and not start with too many projects or too many users. And instead of, of course, for deprioritization, I think, as I mentioned, with the COVID-19 happening uh, for us, that was a, a very challenging situation because we could see that our impact assessment um, has been uh, deprioritizing it was a bit of a challenge to put it back on the on the priority list for for staff members. So it really requires a commitment um, to make sure that there is progress made. The second lesson um, is that it requires a collective effort across teams, and I would really insist on uh, the need for active internal communication. So in our case, we decided to set up. Uh, impact task force uh, that included um, four members of the team that represented different areas of activities, training, business development, and also scientific operations to really make sure that we have a full overview of, uh, of what can be measured and, uh, and make sure that also multiple team members are actively involved in this exercise with us. Uh, obviously, this is not a one-person effort, and uh, we thought it would be also more efficient to have, for instance, our account managers do the follow-up with the companies or with the academic members and uh, where there is already an established relationship um, with the objective that that would increase the chances for, for response to surveys, for instance. Um, but I could see that it's important to, um, to really insist and, and remind the team why they should take time uh, in the day uh, to also collect uh, this information for our impact assessment. So that, that would be the second lesson learned. The third one, and I think it's, it's very much specific to also our work because um, we have to interact with industry users quite a lot. Um, industry users are our main stakeholder group. And um, we were very keen on measuring the impact on industry users. But what the pilot showed is it was quite challenging, especially on the long term. We decided to contact, um, I think it was between 15 and 20 companies uh, that were involved um, with the actress up to five years before. And we had very much a challenging situation because 80 to 90% of the account managers in those companies had left the company or had moved on to other, to other positions. So we haven't managed to retrieve as many findings as we had, as we had hoped for, but I think there were um, three conclusions from that. One is, I think, as Corinne mentioned, uh, qualitative data is also very important. So rather than focusing on the number of companies we can um, have responses for, from, also make sure we have um, interesting testimonies from the few companies that uh, we could reach. Um, the second was we have to make sure that we start this impact assessment on a shorter term. So not waiting four or five years before um, reaching out again about impact, but really starting from one year to two years after the start of the projects to make sure that we prevent um, um, being victim of this, this turnover for our impact assessment. And then the third um, conclusion that we had from that uh, was that we should also focus on the other side of the collaboration, which was our academic members that entered the collaboration with the, with the company, um, which in most cases um, are still in the position and, and with whom we have interaction much more often it was actually much easier to retrieve uh, findings from, from our members and from companies. 
Um, the fourth lesson, and I think it, it's very much linked to the fact that we are a distributed infrastructures, and of course that add complexity to this work. Uh, for the pilot, we decided to only focus on um, projects coordinated by the hub. Uh, but of course, this is only one layer of impact to look at. Uh, in that case, we have 13 countries. Um, so we see that it's also very important that we involve the nodes in this exercise and also equip them uh, to be able to carry out similar assessments at national level. Um, so what we decided to do is um, starting from September, we'll have a small pilot impact assessment um, with two nodes, so really starting with a pilot, um, a French and Swedish nodes, uh, which will be involved in the next six months in trying to piloting uh, impact assessment campaign in the country. So we're also hoping to learn a lot from that experience and then share best practices with uh, the other countries that are part of the Atris. And then the fifth one, um, and I think we learned that because I think we were ambitious and we had those three pathways from the start that we wanted to address in our pilot. And we realized very quickly that each pathway is unique. Um, I think what I mentioned earlier about the difference of responsiveness or feasibility to obtain um, evidence about impact from industry versus our members um, was a challenge, but also for instance, the training uh, pathway is also very different. Uh, we had to ask ourselves if we want to systematically carry out uh, impact surveys, how often do we carry those out? Do we treat a two-day course the same way as a five-day course that also create an e-learning? Um, so we had all these very, a lot of questions that, that rose from, from this exercise and showed us that uh, depending on the stakeholder involved in each pathway, uh, we really have to have a, a tailor-made approach and methodology. And that's it, I think really hands-on lessons. I'm happy to also share uh, a bit more information about um, the findings from the pilot if there are any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Anne-Charlotte. And uh, we are now at the final presentation. So hopefully there will be questions at the end. Again, please note them in the box and uh, Henning will, will take care of of sorting this at the end, if you can indicate also to whom, whom you would like to um, answer the question. So Ivana, Ivana, I will make you presenter now and you can uh, follow up. Okay. Yes, it's okay. It's, thank you. Thanks a lot. So um, thanks for having us. Uh, I think we were the last infrastructure actually joining uh, the project and it was in the very, very end. So it came um, as additional value uh, for us um, um, to the ongoing, uh, actually several parallel processes with, with uh, monitoring our performance and, and uh, seeing if, if there is an impact, uh, socioeconomic impact and, and how to actually include it in what we've been doing, as I said, on, on, on other levels. So um, again, thanks for, th thanks for being part of, of this and including CESDA as, as SSH, Social Sciences and Humanities uh, pilot, I, I believe the only one. Um, so a bit about CESDA. Um, Says this is an Eric uh, as as Adris. Uh, I've known Anshalot for some time now. Um, a distributed research infrastructure, meaning it's in it's in quite a number of countries. You can see that we uh, currently have uh, 22 countries as members, and that's the difference from Adris. For says the countries are members, ministries, usually ministries of research and 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 scientific developments. Uh, are, are our members and then they uh, choose a designated service provider in each country which is usually the archive or, or the data service uh, that is uh, a service provider to SESDA. So uh, as I said in 22 countries um, we have a number of countries aiming uh, at, at membership as you can see uh, in the map dark dark blue uh, that's that says the community um, Ireland and Iceland just joined like Two weeks ago so they are not marked but they, they were 20 num, countries 21 and 22. Um, also says that it's quite old um, it, it's been uh, not operational but an informal uh, consortium of, of countries and, and service providers since 1976 so it's uh, a bit more than 40 years old 
uh, being uh, formalized uh, in terms of uh, having a legal vehicle, having uh, um, formal status uh, only in 2013. Uh, and as you will see, it, it became generic in 2017. Um, so, just very short overview of what this is actually doing. Um, we uh, are trying to allow uh, cross-European resource discovery, basically providing social sciences and humanities data to researchers across Europe. Um, and we uh, are very much concerned about the quality of data and metadata. Um, we're also trying to include new data sets uh, uh, all the time so that we can widen the selection of, of uh, a basic data that, that we are allowing our researchers to, to do excellent science with. Um, to do that, uh, our archives uh, need to be of top quality, uh, so that's why certification uh, of data archiving organizations is, is something also on top of our priorities. It's called uh, uh, core trust seal, uh, and that is like a stamp of quality that our archives uh, are constantly aim for, and they have to renew it once you obtain it. it it's not forever, and so on. Uh, we also do a lot of trainings, uh, both for uh, internal says the community for data archivists and, and for scientific community. Um, working all the time on tools, uh, on, on dissemination of data in, in a more appropriate or more quality way. And of course, we're trying to, to keep in touch with, with peer uh, institutions like ICPSR uh, on, on, on global level uh, whenever it's possible. Um, once again, the mission of CESDA, and, and that probably uh, uh, answers the question for what is CESDA here, uh, to provide a full-scale sustainable research infrastructure uh, to enable social sciences and humanities research community to, to do the high quality research uh, and contribute, of course, to all the challenges that we have today, COVID being, being one of them. Uh, uh, and, and not to go into too many details because of time, but I think uh, that the, the main feature of, of CESDA is that we are actually providing a huge catalog of, of social sciences and humanities data sets. Uh, we have at the moment around uh, 30,000 and that's, that's rising as we speak. And at the moment, it's, it is the biggest in Europe. Um, um, comparison, um, for comparison, uh, ICPSR, so our fandom in the US, the US has around 11,000 uh, data sets available in their, in their catalog. Um, it says also uh, functions in four pillars. It's trust, certification, quality, uh, training group providing training both internally and externally, uh, technical group providing the whole uh, technical backbone of CESDA, and of course tools and services, uh, which is actually concerned in, in developing our own tools and services for the research community and for the internal CESDA community. Uh, as I mentioned, we obtained uh, ERIC status in 2017. It is connected to, to uh, some of the things regarding monitoring and performance that I will, I will mention a bit, a bit, a bit later. So um, our members are all traditionally EU member states and, and associated countries, uh, but also third countries and other associated countries can become a member of CESDA as well as intergovernmental organizations. So at the moment, we, we actually have only EU member states and some, some, uh, some associated countries. Um, relationship with ESRI. So as, as um, all ERICs, we started as, as an ESRI project, uh, although, as I said, says that it's quite old and it's been uh, functioning uh, for some time uh, before it actually became, became an ERIC. Um, we are also ESRI, ESRI landmark, like, like Adris, uh, there are five ESRI landmarks in, in social science and humanities, and uh, all of us actually became landmarks in 2016 and, and continued with the, with the status. And why is this so important? Because uh, European Strategic Forum for Research Infrastructures, as, as, uh, as a body that actually initiated ERICS in a way, um, and there are a lot of them at the moment, is now very concerned, uh, rightfully, with sustainability, which means uh, both financial, organizationally, um, in terms of human resources, which is organizational type uh, that, that we have, uh, with challenges both being single single-sided and, and distributed, and of course technically. So uh, that is one layer that, that we have to keep in mind, uh, that there will be uh, sustainability questions and monitoring from, from S3. Um, and that is in a way the, the, the first instance that uh, made us start thinking uh, about uh, performance and indicators and how to show our funders uh, and, and our users that says they're going to stay uh, around for some time, that we can do it actually. 
So um, it's it's it of course the socio-economic impact, and that goes down into mission, vision, vision, and goals, um, and and boils again down to to uh, measurable indicators or, or KPIs impacting the organizational structure, and and in the end funding or vice versa. If you want to, we can go from from top from bottom to top, uh, and and uh, end up with the same with the same conclusion. We have to be sustainable. So um, just a bit about broader context. Um, S3, uh, as already mentioned, uh, has issued over the past two years uh, some recommendations uh, how to how to try to measure uh, our performance. And Competitiveness Council actually requested from S3 to come up with a mechanism to um, to monitor uh, the performance of of Eric's. And Eric's were also asked to come up with KPIs that would fit into that mechanism. Um, so. Um, what we did actually, we took all those recommendations. Uh, we 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 also based a lot on on Scripta sustainability uh, documents. We, we have it here listed. Uh, again, some more recommendations. But what I personally like maybe the most is OECD uh, conference that was uh, I think in March 2018, uh, dealing with socioeconomic impact of RIs and and uh, they were very focused, saying that. We, uh, each infrastructure should actually distinguish between performance uh, um, and impact and time and tie those indicators very closely to organizational goals. So it should be actually a crutch, a tool for the management uh, to, 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 to measure the processes, to see the advancements, to see the gaps uh, and then inform the funders, uh, which is the main, the main, uh, the main point. Um, I'm actually glad that I'm, I'm, I'm in the end uh, because you heard already a lot about other types of, of infrastructures uh, and we are of course very, very different. So um, for CESDA, obvious KPIs are a number of studies, of course, including sensitive data, uh, we have those. Uh, it, it's about people, we are dealing with social sciences, humanities, then uh, about deposits, registered users, uh, a lot about reuse. Uh, CESDA is not on the producing side, we are on dissemination of data side. So uh, uh, reuse uh, is, is actually uh, extremely important for us. And then the purpose, um, less obvious, also important. Um, how many members do we have? We are uh, reaching to, to um, European coverage. Um, have we managed that? We're at 22 at the moment. Uh, is the quality high enough? Are the standards and says that high enough? Uh, so, archives should be certified. Uh, how, how much staff is working on CESDA activities? Uh, CESDA has around 500 people working uh, in all of the archives in 22 countries, but not all of them work actually on CESDA activities. So uh, that's, that's the question. Uh, number of tools, number of training courses that we are providing, number of EU projects, they're all numbers, they're all countable, and, and we can count them and we can say, okay, this is how we progressed from last year to this year. What we don't have at all are patents. What we don't have at all are publications. So says there's not a type of infrastructure where uh, a scientist comes, does the research, and then publish a paper. Actually, it's it's the, the other way around. Uh, the, the 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 research is usually already published when we get the data set by the scientists deposited in one of says the archives, and then just took into the says the says the catalogs to be allowed to all the other scientists to actually reuse it, make new research. So um, there are um, some very very crucial things that uh, some uh, some infrastructures some infrastructures things there that they're, they're, they're crucial and they are crucial for them, but not necessarily for CESDA. And uh, that's why I was actually uh, very glad that uh, Hans Jorgen was talking about the context, and that is something that is uh, I think very very important. The context of functioning of a certain research infrastructure, all the specific variables that are important for that research infrastructure should be taken into account when monitoring progress or measuring socioeconomic impact. We are really very, very different. Uh, although you can say that there are many uh, common denom denominators and that actually that, that improved uh, because what uh, ESRI did um, in the last two years um, mandated by a uh, competitiveness council, uh, uh, they formed a group it's S3 monitoring working group that is actually working on assessment of research infrastructures of ERICS mainly. And they took all the statutes of all ERICS and they said, okay, this is from the from the statutes uh, and, and the goals 
are very much aligned. We all have uh, scientific excellence. We all have uh, education and training. We all have uh, many types of collaboration, uh, either in Europe or on uh, international level, meaning globally. Uh, we all do outreach to public. We all use some kind of data, produce them or, or, or disseminate them for further use. And we all have some management. Either if we are single-sided or distributed, as, as Anna Charlotte said, uh, it's, it's a small coordination hub in, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm located in Norway, so says the service headquarters are in Norway. We're a small office of 10 people. So uh, these are the, the, all the areas that we, have, uh, that we have very much in common. But there are also very fundamental differences. And here is where OECD uh, uh, recommendation about taking everything into context, link all the, the performance indicators to your own goals, uh, goals and objectives, uh, and, and mission and vision, uh, ultimately, uh, have to be taken into, into account. Uh, so uh, we just took all S3 areas, we tweaked a bit uh, the specific indicators for each area just to adjust it to CESDA, uh, and then we added CESDA areas, which is readiness for risk, which is extremely important for us, including FAIR, technical system, quality standards, then we have also public and internal indicators. Uh, they are connected to the work of our working groups, which actually take care of all the pillars, strategic pillars of CESDA. And then we have uh, we have it measured on the level of service providers and CESDA main office, because we are also doing quite a lot of uh, coordination, not the core business, but coordination. So um, as you can see, it's, it's, it's very layerly. Uh, there are many layers, many levels. Uh, for CESDA, and this is still work in progress. So basically, when we started talking to uh, ESF and, and our IPOT project, we were already well in the process with all of that, and I'm very thankful that they took a look at everything we did and, and tried to help us to see uh, which indicators are actually um, socioeconomic indicators, what are activities, what are outcomes, uh, uh, and so on. So, so that was that was really really helpful uh, uh, exercise for us. Um, uh, I, I wish only it, uh, we 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 had started um, earlier. Um, what we also learned trying to sort of analyze our activities is that we already have quite a lot of impact. Um, how to measure it? That that's another story. But national level, uh, since we are talking to the ministries uh, and we are talking to them at least twice a year. Uh, uh, we do uh, have um, a certain level uh, of, of, of influence on the policies. Uh, then we have the trusted repositories in 22 countries connected to universities mostly. Uh, we are insisting on standards. Uh, we are influencing jobs at service providers. We do outreach to new members, to new countries, to potential service providers, potential archives, either um, um, currently non-existing. So we are tr trying to help them build an archive in a country. Or, uh, or very mature and old, but they need to innovate and so on and so forth. So um, on national level, there is quite a, a, a lot of paths that that uh, we we see as as uh, as a possibility for us to uh, actually as as the fact we we have influence on that level. On E level, um, the scientific community uh, that we are trying to serve, so the the, the utmost important stakeholder. Um, is the research community for data sharing and reuse for, for training. Uh, we're also uh, involved with thematic data clusters uh, uh, in EOSC uh, because as this coordinating one of the cluster project, projects, it's, it's called SHOC. Um, policy levels, we are in many uh, working groups. Uh, we, we are in ERIC forum as well as Atris ERIC. Um, and then we are, of course, uh, fighting for, for EC funding uh, and, and trying to do the widening and, and, and have a say in, in standards, and if possible, even set them. Um, and as I already mentioned, there, there is international level of functioning uh, with the, within the ISC. So there are specific, discipline specific uh, groups and organizations, uh, but we are also trying to, to widen collaborations to, to other disciplines. So um, if, if you go this way, I'm, I'm very sure that all of the infrastructures that are actually presented today uh, can have uh, can, can say, of, of course, we are doing all of that and, and we have impact. So um, sometimes I think it's, it's very good to, to take a look at the obvious, what is right under your nose, um, to, to see that you're already doing uh, some of the stuff that you're supposed to measure yourself against. You just need to figure out how to actually do it, because th this is not easy. This for, for, for us, it was, it was the hard part. 
So just, just to summarize, and as I said, we are still in the process. Um, um, Anne Charlotte mentioned the timeline. Uh, what we have now is a very, uh, I was called drafty, drafty version of uh, of, uh, of our KPIs and, 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 and indicators, um, and that is currently being um, offered for consultation uh, to says the directors, so to 22 directors in 22 countries of our archives. After that, there will be a pilot uh, with the different types of archives because some are very, as I said, old, big, some are very young, uh, uh, very small, uh, and we have to test uh, all the indicators uh, on, on all of them and see how it works. Uh, maybe not all of them, them will work, but we'll, we'll have to refine the list after that. Then it goes to another round of consultations to, to, uh, to service providers, and then finally to our general, general assembly, hopefully by the, end, uh, by the end of this year, because as for monitoring group, will actually at one point come uh, to all the ERICs and we, if we don't have our own indicators, uh, they, their initial list will then be imposed to us and not all of them actually work for SESDA. So it's just best to, to, to work out uh, your own. And that's the opportunity that S3 actually left to, to, to ERICs uh, with the final report from, from January 2020. I said, this is a proposal. You can use it if you don't have your own. If you have your own, by all means, explain what they mean to you. Uh, explain the, the method of collection and so on and so forth. Uh, but if you don't have them, then, then they will just measure your, your uh, performance against what they developed. So uh, this is the main, uh, in a way, the main, um, the main incentive for us to, to finish with the process within this year. So once again, just, just to summarize, so it says this here to provide data or full-scale sustainable research infrastructure, meaning not only data, but also tools and services uh, to enable research community to, to, to do high quality research in social sciences and humanities. Uh, it is for researchers ultimately, but then also for our service providers, for funders, member countries, for policymakers. And how are we doing that? Well, by providing trusted platform, uh, trusted catalog with tools, services, to publish and to reuse research data, to be completely complied uh, in compliance with FAIR principles, uh, to provide training to the research community uh, covering the whole data cycle or research cycle, and of course setting the standards and quality criteria for research infrastructures in the SSH uh, area. That's all for me and I'm open for questions, of course. Okay. Thank you very much. So we have concluded our presentation. Henning, uh, are you there to help us with the with the questions from the audience? Yes, I am. It's telling me that the maximum number of webcams is reached, so I'll stay in the background. Um, that is fine. And we have about 10 minutes to uh, handle the questions because we need to finish at 12 sharp. Yeah. Okay, here I am. So first question question will be by Frederic, which is about how we use the RI path, uh, I guess project overall insights and the tool in determining the results, I suppose, uh, during the pilots. And maybe I can start on this one myself and then you complement. Uh, I think my answer would be it is a process of co-creation that we went through because it went time-wise, it went in parallel. We were still finalizing the tool when at the same time we were already progressing on the pilots. And I think as also Gaston is nodding, uh, we were moving along with Alba and Daisy. We of course uh, had in our minds uh, what we had already achieved in the project, the different pathways, the different ideas, how we could go about measuring things in questionnaires and possibly also in the patent analysis. Um, but at the time, to answer the question very simply, there was no tool yet available that we could have put in practice that is for subsequent efforts. I don't know if anybody wants to add, possibly from the panel or also Anna, you. Yes, no. Yes, I would like to stress that uh, the, the joint uh, experiences, the joint learning that we did during the project was giving rise to the tool on the one hand side and to these pilots on the other hand side, as Henning was saying. So it's not it was not directly used because time-wise it didn't fit, but both things <laughs> used the, the common uh, uh, ground. Yeah. So uh, I think it will be useful to conduct uh, uh, pilots in the future. Okay. Yes, Cody. I wanted to say, um, to build on that, um, 
what I really learned was that there is not an easy recipe that you can follow. You're going to have to do some thinking and go through the process. And this is where the tool will help you through that process by giving you the resources to go through it. But don't think you're going to be able to just apply a recipe, step one, two, and three. You're going to have to do a lot of thinking and a lot of consultation in the, along the way. And that's normal. OK, perfect. Frederick, any reply to this? Um, uh, people can hear me. Okay. Uh, no, no, it's all fine. Uh, that's why Frederick back from uh, your open Excel. No, no, it's fine. I just wanted to see how you wanted to get the uh, the the tools and uh, and then how you connect. Okay, you get a pass and then you have to develop all the impacts and then get the data access access. So it's a lot of work. I understand. Um, and uh, but I just wanted to see the liaison. Okay, but Gaston also replied. So you uh, you used your experience and then you finalize the tools. So that's fine. It's just if I may add, I know I cannot use a camera anymore, but it's Anna. Uh, in, in our case, uh, and especially working with the Atris, what we have tried to do in a way is uh, to, to approach the tool in a bottom-up way, which means that we looked at what were the pre-existing data that the RI already had at hand and try to work with this to build and to construct some pathways the other possibility is to take a pathway and then go and look into the associated indicators and impact areas and so on and then initiate the data collection uh, strategy or methodology so there, there are different ways of approaching the tool i would say okay, okay then next i have mariam Yegian on the difficulties of data collection which i suppose was originally addressed to Gaston because he was asked at the time. Mariam, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Mariam Yegian, uh, representing Kendall Synchrotron Research Institute in Armenia. Uh, my question uh, relates to the difficulties that you faced during the data collection or survey conduction process. Uh, were those units or staff that you were uh, contacting with uh, for your purposes uh, ready to uh, provide the necessary info and whether the quality of that information uh, was uh, sufficient for your purposes and uh, what's about the research infrastructures which do not have such organized uh, units or information collected regarding the impact assessment because this is really a challenge for those areas which are just starting the process. So, please. So, uh, yes, I, I agree that it is challenging and you have to plan all steps carefully. I could not elaborate through all of it, but uh, just to mention a couple of key points. Uh, of course, you must start out from a, from a database of your own users in some way. Yeah, you, you, I don't think it's easy to conduct a survey just openly outside without a given database to start with. And this we did. And uh, then the second step is you have to plan very, very carefully your survey because it's very easy that after you get the answers, you realize which which questions you forgot to include. So what we did to minimize the risk in that sense, and I think it was a good idea, is that we made a first version of the survey. We chose a few uh, very friendly users, so users whom we knew in advance would answer very uh, very thoroughly, and we tested the survey with them, and we gave them the opportunity to comment on anything which they found was missing or was wrong was well, or was not easy to understand. And we didn't change completely the survey after this, but we tweaked a few things which were very useful. And then we conducted the real survey in the end. And, uh, and then uh, I can tell you that I was fearing, we were very, very afraid all the time that it would be very difficult to get many answers to this survey. And, but we got a fair amount of answers, and uh, most of all, the answers we got were from the users who were the most frequent users. So if you uh, do some numbers on the total percentage of the activity of ALBA during the next few years, which is reflected in the answers by the users 
who chose to answer, it is really high. I think it is more than 50% of the activity, not 50% of the total number of users in the database, but yes, more than 50% of the real activity. So I hope this illustrates a little bit what you asked. Yeah, thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I think the last point is an important one, which we can also confirm for DC, exactly the same story that we had a cycle before where we looked at the questions and then also the recurrent users, of course, are those most uh, attached to the organization and would most commonly answer. Okay, then there was a question by Saeed for Corinne, but he had to leave, I'm afraid, so he'll probably get back to you by email. And then I have uh, Olaf Schwarzkopf with a number of questions, so I leave it to you to explain those in more detail and elaborate. Olaf, floor is yours. Okay, this is Olaf Schwarzkopf, Helmholtz Centrum Berlin, operating a BSI-2 synchrotron radiation facility. The first question is to my friend Gaston. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Gaston. Um, what you told us about the patent data mining was very interesting uh, for us. Um, could you elaborate on how um, time FTE money expensive it was to actually get the data mined? And is there a possibility to have it automatized through web? interfaces for instance well we did this within our ipads so mm -hmm. the resources devoted to this were completely fully included in the in the our ipads project yeah and this was done the technical part was done by our seal colleagues we worked together with them we devoted uh, mm -hmm. some some days of activity to fine-tuning what needed to be done but actually doing it was done by them. So perhaps somebody from XIL uh, may be in the audience and may be uh, able to, to quantify this. Yeah, Jessica, so you will be able to speak now if you so choose. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so good morning to everybody. So this was an interesting exercise that we uh, performed in collaboration with ALBA. So I have to say that it was a joint effort uh, from uh, um, between ALBA and uh, CSIL. So the first uh, step was to have uh, a very structured database that, of publication that was already available at ALBA. So ALBA was already monitoring in a very good way publication. So what we did was to start from this publication database and then on the basis of the uh, our access to patents database and uh, uh, through the use of uh, bibliometric uh, techniques, we uh, matched uh, basically the two kinds of information. So information included in patents and uh, information included in the publication database. And uh, this uh, required at least one amount of work to, to perform this kind of analysis. So in terms of resource, uh, it, uh, it entails at least one amount, I can say, uh, uh, from consultant point of view. Uh, but basically the key ingredient from the uh, research infrastructure point of view is to have a well-structured database of publication. So this is a very important first step for doing and carry out this analysis. Okay, so may then, I end? Sorry, then, Jessica, because we don't know if yes. the system shuts down at 12 o'clock, I just realized. So in case everything breaks down now, I would like to give the floor to Anna briefly to say a few words of closing as long as we still can. Again, my apologies for being impolite. Uh, I wasn't aware, I just got an internal email that actually this all might be ending at 12 o'clock. So I had to interrupt. Anna, yeah, it's important it to make sure that we thank you all before we, we close. I guess we have reached our, our end time, and I'm sorry for that. We, we, we may have other unanswered questions, but I'm sure that the audience will find a way to, to contact the speakers or our, us. Uh, so thank you all uh, again for, for your participation, and uh, I guess we, we will need to, to close the meeting. Sorry for this sharp ending, uh, but I hope, of course, that we will remain in, in contact even the end after the end of the official uh, i mean the official end of the project which is tomorrow so thank you again and uh, have have a good uh, rest of the week <laughs>